bow my knees before your majesty. I bow my knees before your holiness. I pray that in this session, Lord, you will measure a thousand cubits and take us deeper into the river. I pray that you will fill my mouth with your word. May your great hand be upon me as I declare your counsel, your oracles to your people. And I pray, Lord, as I declare your word, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, cast out devils, work miracles, signs and wonders in the midst of your people. May the heavens be open over us this morning. Father, reach out to every man and every woman under the sound of my voice. Starting from the ones here on site and to the millions watching through the medias. I pray that Lord, your great and mighty hand will reach out to everyone. Give free cause to your word and be glorified, my Father. In the name of Jesus the Christ and all the believers in the house shout Amen three times. Hallelujah. If you have holy hands, can you put them together as we give glory? Come on now, you can do better than that. No. Can we make a louder noise as we do for Jesus? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. I'm so thrilled to be here this morning and to be in Makodi, in Benue State. First time to be in Benue State. I must confess that Nigeria is not the place I travel all the time. This is my third visit to this great country. And the first time I came to Nigeria for a meeting was 2001. That was Calabar. The second time was 2003 or 04. That was Jalingo and Yola in the north. And then I caught off with Nigeria, and this is me now. <laughs> Permit me to salute Apostle Arume and his dear wife for the kind invitation to have us come here. We appreciate the invitation, and we appreciate the great hospitality. Thank you so much, and I want to salute the leadership of this great ministry, the work you do resonate in the nations. You know, in my own country, so many people are glued to what's happening here now. So many people follow what is happening here. And we want to give glory to our king for that. I must confess that since I came yesterday, we've been so blessed. The word last night was so deep. And thank you to Apostle Gideon for this word. Oh, you know, my wife, when you were concluding, my wife said, the, he's, he's done it all. The, the road is free now. <laughs> Thank you for making my job easy this morning. Hallelujah. Uh, my name is Apostle Pierre Nyangok. I know my people here don't want to call that name. They don't want to bite their tongues. It's, say Nyangok. Nyangok. Say it again, Nyangok. Nyangok. It sounds difficult to pronounce, but it's a sweet name. <laughs> Throughout my school, my school uh, uh, years, all my teachers and lecturers had difficulties pronouncing this name. That's such a beautiful name. My name simply means the light bearer. Nyangok means the light bearer. <laughs> Nyangok means the one who holds the torch and walks ahead of others so he can show them the way. My parents were very prophetic when they gave me the name. You know, let me anchor to what uh, Apostle Gideon was concluding on talking about the fight of our parents. Oh, man, when he was talking about that, he was telling my story. I am that stone which the builders rejected. You know, I got born again. I was a teenager. I was a teenager, 16. And in my community, not just in my family, in the, I'm from the northern part of Cameroon and in, the, in our culture, in the community, 
being born again was, was not known at all until I got saved. So I became the first fruit of salvation, not only in my town, but in the whole region. It was a new religion and a new thing. Talk about beatings and rejection. If they could beat Christ out of me, I wouldn't be a Christian now. I went through heavy persecution. You see, up until now, when I go back to my village, sometimes they have to reintroduce me to my cousins and aunties because they thought I had joined one mad thing, I mean, like crazy stuff. So they would introduce me and say, this is the son of our uncle or our father, so, so, and so, who joined that, that, that religion. But we thank God for what God has done. Today, the people that rejected me, when they see my poster, they say, this is our brother. <laughs> when they see me on television, they call and say, we are watching you, and we are proud of what you are doing. <laughs> Hallelujah. I came all the way with my wife, my precious wife. Please, can you stand so that the Makwadi people can see you and greet you? She, she is my sister, my friend, my fiance, my wife, and the mother of all my children. She is such a generous giver. She's given me five babies free of charge. We got two beautiful daughters and three sons, wonderful sons. And they're all serving God alongside with us. We've been married now 24 years. And we're counting. Our journey is just beginning. We've traveled all over the world together preaching this gospel. We met uh, some 26 years, no, 27 years back. 27, 28 years back when we were students at the university. And, uh, yeah. And on the journey, I came with our first daughter, our firstborn. I call her my might and the beginning of my strength. Her name is Joseph Lagrand. She just she was has been newly appointed as Daddy's PA. We give God the praise for her life. She's I think she is enjoying this trip more than us. Ye yesterday I told her. I, I have the impression it is you, Apostle Arume, invited, and we came to accompany you. <laughs> Hallelujah. I bring you wonderful greetings from the beautiful nation of Cameroon. They love you, and they want to come and be a part of what you are doing. I bring you greetings from our church family, Alpha Naomi. Alpha Naomi is the acronym for our, all families and nations outreach ministries. We are based, uh, our base is Yaounde. We have churches across Cameroon and out. And uh, we are, they all send greetings. They are watching us and they're praying for, for what God is going to do here. Are you ready for something new God is about to do? In now, during my stay with you in this conference, Apostle Arume has made my job very easy. He wants me to tell you of my encounters with the great monarch of Zion. And that is very easy for me to do. But I can promise you, as I tell you of the encounters, get ready, some strange things will happen to you in this ground. How many of you are ready to see Jesus? In John chapter 12, the Greeks came to, the, to Jerusalem for a, for a feast. And when the feast was over, they went to Philip and said to Philip, we want to see Jesus. Like Apostle Gideon said, until you see him, you're still in the outer court. See, there are some things will happen to you when you set your eyes on him. 
So today I want to tell you of my first rapture to heaven. By the grace of God, I've been raptured to heaven four times already. And I can't tell you how many times Jesus has come to my room and has come to meet me. Not in a vision and in a dream. It's good to see Jesus in a vision and it's good to see him in a dream. But it's another thing altogether when he walks into your room. See, you can't be the same after you have seen him. Seeing him once is enough for a lifetime. If he gives you the privilege of seeing him many times, it's even better. So on this day, I want to start telling you my first rapture to heaven. And I pray that the time will permit me to flow and deliver everything that, like, as much as I can deliver in a session. Get, get your Bibles with me to Revelation chapter 4, and we're reading from verse 1. The Bible reads, after this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be here after. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne was set in heaven and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first beast was like a lion, the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like an eagle flying. And the four beasts had each of them six, six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory and honor and thanks to him, that sat on the throne, who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. The story of my first rapture to heaven happened on the, the night of the 3rd of July, 2015. We were then in a retreat ground in the United States of America in a little town called Ashland in the state of Virginia. But before I get to the 3rd of July, that there was a rupture in our walk with God and in our service with God. And the rupture occurred in the month of April 2012. I, must, I started telling you that I gave my life to Christ. I was a teenage boy. From secondary school, through high school, through the university, I served the Lord full time. And from university, we went, my wife and I, we went to full time service. And we've been serving God now full time for over 25, 27 years. And I became a, we became pastors and by the grace of God started the ministry Alpha Naomi, which we are running and we, were, we started traveling by the grace of God, preaching in the nations of the world. But in the month of April 2012, we came back, we just came back from the, a trip in the United States and the Lord had glorified himself. We had preached and we seen many people blessed and many people healed and God had done great things. When we came back home, Finished telling the testimonies and the stories of the great things God had done. Suddenly, somebody says suddenly. suddenly. All of a sudden, there was an emptiness, a vacuum in my heart. 
Suddenly, I didn't want to do ministry anymore. See, Apostle Gideon said it this morning. He said the demand for ministry are even are greater than the demand for going to heaven. But I even want to make it better, Apostle Gideon. See, some of you just want to do ministry. The demands of working with God and serving God and pleasing God are even greater than the demands for ministry. So many people are into ministry. They preach and they do the works of ministry. But there's another thing altogether to walk with him, to please him. See, I was telling some people last week, in heaven there's nothing like great man of God. It doesn't exist. Great men of God are not known in heaven. Heaven only knows the good and the faithful. There's no measurement for great, greatness. God only measures the good and the faithful. So suddenly, all of a sudden, a vacuum in my heart. I didn't want to do ministry anymore. Didn't just want to go out and preach another sermon. So I retreated and I spent my days locked up in my room, in my prayer closet, asking God questions about life, real questions. See, in my experience, I discovered if you do not dare ask God real questions, he will never give you real answers. The reason being simply that God does not assume that you want to know. He said in his word, give not holy things to dogs and give not precious pearls to swines. So God doesn't assume. If he, had, if he assumes for you, he will have to assume for all of us. So if you do not show interest, God doesn't assume that you are interested. So someday, you have to face God and ask him real questions about your life, about your calling, about your being here. So I spent days locked up in my room asking God questions about life, real questions. In those days, 2012, there are three major things that troubled me as a minister. Number one, I was troubled by John chapter 14, verse 12. In John 14, 12, Jesus said, those who believe in him will do the works that he did and even do greater works because he goes to the Father. And Jesus had gone to the Father many years and I have been a full-time pastor for over a decade. By 2012, I had been a pastor now for over... And I was getting to 15 years of full-time ministry and I wasn't seeing John 14, 12 coming forth for me and for many people that I knew around me. Even making it worse, I even saw many great ministers, great like we call them, go to the occult powers, occultism to go get rings and magic rings and magic chains and magic soap to do ministry. So I began to question God about John 14, 12. What is this thing about John 14, 12? Did you say John 14, 12 that we were going to really do it or it was just a way of talking? That was my first question. See, Jesus said we would do the works that he did, meaning all of us that believe, not just the ministers, all of us that believe we are supposed to be walking the street of Makodi and then find 10 lepers and just tell them I will be clean and instantly they are clean. That's what Jesus did. Or meeting a crowd, 5,000 men without counting their wives and children with five loaves, feed them and take 12 baskets home. No? Yeah, Jesus said we would do those works that he did. He said we would find uh, blind men that would be shouting, please, I will, uh, son of David, have mercy on me and say, it is well, your eyes are restored. And then, as simple as that. See, when I answered the call to ministry, that's what I was seeing. That's what I was pursuing. I, I didn't just become a pastor so I can bury the dead and baptize a few people. No. <laughs> but it was already 15 years or more down the line of my service to God. And John 14, 12 wasn't forthcoming. Not, on, not only in my life, but even in the life of the people that I look up to as spiritual leaders and so on. So it became a, it, it became a concern and I told God, I don't want to go back and preach another sermon until I know why John 14, 12 is not happening. How many of you are interested to know why John 14, 12 is not happening in most of our lives and in most of our churches and in most of our ministries? That was my first, my first concern. My second concern then 
was the fact that I was traveling across Cameroon and across nations, not just Africa, even in other parts of the world, seeing men of God that were, to me, genuine men who loved the Lord and served the Lord in a genuine manner, manner but lived in a poverty that could not be described. And I couldn't reconcile their consecration to God with the level of their poverty. Knowing God to be the one who has all the silver and the gold of the world, he doesn't even know what to do. The Bible tells us then that the streets of heaven are paved with gold. So how can our heavenly father, our employer, be this rich and his servants on the earth are begging for bread? I couldn't understand that. So that was my second concern. My third concern, Mama Dina, was the rise of of this other gospel that is making waves in all of our nations now. The, the rise of false prophets and false pastors who, who pulled mammoth crowds across the nations. And I, I looked into that and I said, God, I, I, it seems like I'm the only one that is concerned with the rise of this other thing that looks like the gospel world, but which is not the gospel. I was even more shocked to see that some men of God or some servants of God that are considered to be genuine ministers were caught up with this thing and followed the train of the moment. And I spent my days crying in my room and asking God why and asking God how come. And one Thursday morning, one fateful Thursday morning of that month of April 2012, I was in my room. I was on my knees, I was on my face crying and asking God and telling God, I don't want to go back to preaching until I get answers. That morning, he didn't come himself, but he whispered to my ears. He said, young God, do you want to have answers to the many questions that you are asking? I said, yes. Then he said, if you want the answers, shut down everything you are doing and go to the mountain. When he said that, I left my room my prayer closet, and I ran to the kitchen. I called my wife. I said, sweetheart, come, come, come. And then she came. We were just the two of us in the house. The, the herbs, herb, how herbs were walking outside. So I said, come. She came. And I said, he has just spoken to me. And she said, what has he said? I said, he said, if we want to have the answers to the many questions that we are asking him, we should shut down everything and go to the mountain. And then she said, if that's all, it looked like a small thing to her. Say, if that's all he's asking for, let's go. So we sat down and planned that uh, by Sunday evening, we're going to go travel out of Yaounde. We live in Yaounde, the capital city. So we planned, let's wait for Sunday. We'll go to church on Sunday morning, uh, give instruction to the church and to our collaborators, and then we will go. Because we didn't know for how long we were going to go. So we planned that we were going to... So I, we, we planned that we we're going to go to the northwest of Cameroon, somewhere after Bamenda. If you, some of you who know Cameroon or geography. We wanted to go somewhere after Bamenda on the hill, hillside of the northwest and hide on a mountain there until God is done with us. At the back of my mind, I knew it was going to take us like 30 days, maximum 40 days. We'd maybe do a 40 days fast. And then within that time, the Lord will show up and then tell us what the way forward is. So on Sunday morning, we got to church. Our cars were loaded with our stuff. We got to church to say goodbye, give instruction, and leave. And while I was talking to them, suddenly the Holy Ghost moved into the service, and the service turned. And the Lord said, you are not going anywhere. You're going to be here, and you and all these people, you're going to go through the journey. So that Sunday morning, I announced to the church, that all of our programs were suspended for further notice. There will be no more preaching, no more conferences, no more traveling, no more anything. We're going to do just one thing. From tomorrow, Monday, we'll be fasting and praying until the Lord says stop. So we, I, I tell out a program for us to meet in church four times a day. From, that, from the following day, Monday morning. We will meet morning 5 to 7 a.m., then the students and the people and the workers will go to work. We will stay back in church. The pastors and the other brethren we will encamp. We are literally camping at, on, the, on the church side. We will, fight, we will pray from 5 a.m. to 7. They go. We will stay. 
continue praying, reading, and studying. At midday, they will get a break, come back to church. We will pray midday to 2 p.m. Then they will go back, and then they will come back at 5, and then we will pray from 5 to 8 p.m. Then we all go home to break the fast, get, get shower and get refreshed, to come back at midnight and pray midnight to 3 a.m. It took us 10 hours of praying per day for. We did 30 days. After 30 days, we went to 40 days. When we concluded the 40 days, he said 21 days. When we concluded 21 days, he said 90 days. And after the ninth, at the end of the 90 days, he said continue without counting days anymore. So it took us five years. How many of you still want to see Jesus? <laughs> Apostle Gideon, five years the church was shut down. Nothing happening except prayer and fasting. Five years. From 2012 to 2017, five years. No traveling, no preaching, no conference, no seminar. As a matter of fact, at the, point, at the time, the Lord said, shut down your phone, shut down your internet, shut down everything. Now, it might interest you to know that the minister, he who preaches the gospel lives by the gospel, right? So if you are not preaching and you are not doing anything, you stay staying home, even if you have some money at the bank, if you keep taking and using and taking and using, and the bills did not, were not, we suspect, suspended ministry, but the bills were not suspended. My five children had to go to school, so you had to pay school fees, you had to pay everything, and all the bills that you can imagine in a normal home. So before soon, the money was gone. Now I was tempted to answer a few invitations here and there to go, and the Lord said, you're going nowhere. Great encounters require great sacrifices. If you want to have encounters, number one thing you must be ready for is the price to pay. The sacrifice. See, glories, every glory has a story. Before you celebrate the glory, you got to know the story behind. That's why I don't just want to tell you that, oh, on the 3rd, on the 3rd of July 2015, he took me to heaven. Oh, I would have been happy to tell you that we were sitting in a restaurant, a nice restaurant, and eating a T-bone steak, you know, or a nice roasted fish when God took me to heaven. No, it didn't happen like that. It doesn't even happen like that. <laughs> See, from the time I said yes to Jesus, I've always been a passionate, I've been passionate for Jesus. Everyone that knows me knows me. I knows that I have, from the days of secondary school up until now, I am all out for Jesus, 100%. See, I had this idea at the back of my mind. That if I love God and I manifest zeal and passion for him, someday when God will wake up in, in a good mood, he will remember me and look for me and ask for and send for me. You know, like they sent for David, he was in the, in the bush taking care of the animals and then suddenly one gentleman came running and said, hey David, come, the prophet is at home, they are looking for you. You know, that's the idea I had at the back of my mind. Some, someday when God wakes up with a, in a good mood, he will remember me and suddenly he will ask for, where's Nyango? Go get it for me. And then I will come and then he will give me a big anointing and I will become a great man of God. But guess what? In 2012, I discovered that God wakes up every day with the same mood. There will never be a day when God is in a good mood. You know why? Because God doesn't have hormones. It is us that have hormones. It is our hormones that are responsible for mood swings, you know. Women have more hormones than men. So, you know, that's why sometimes you sit with your wife and you haven't quarreled and before you know it, her face is looking like the rain is coming. <laughs> I didn't say my wife. Why are you looking this way? <laughs> Apostle James tells us about God and he says he is called the father of light and in him there is no variableness nor shadows of turnings. 
So God is stable. That's why we call him the eternal God. He is, see, his mood is the same. He's stable. He doesn't vary. So if, if you do not take the first step towards him, he doesn't come to you. James, it is James that said, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. In other words, if you do not draw near to God, what will happen? If he draws near to you first, he will have to draw near to all of us because on the day of judgment, he will be found guilty of partiality. That's why he, he threw the ball at us and said, it is up to you to draw near first. You take the first step. If you take one step, he will take a 10 or 100 towards you. Hallelujah. So, we shut down everything. Five years. Invitations to preach all over the world. But he said, don't go. Or go nowhere, stay here. Oh, we started first year, second year, third year. On the third year, 2015, Boko Haram. Have you, you know Boko Haram? No? In Cameroon, in the northern part of Cameroon, Boko Haram. 2015 was their peak. Every day, killing of people. In, I mean, it was, it was hot. And we were in this time of fasting. One morning, the Lord came and said, I am sending you to the north. I want you to go to the north, to that red zone where Boko Haram is causing havoc. And I want you to go and do a prophetic walk to push back the assaults of Boko Haram. So I stopped the prayer and I told the, 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 the brethren, the Lord says, we should go to the north, the northern part to where Boko Haram is, to go and stop the attacks on Boko Haram. So how many of you are volunteering? <laughs> and they all said, Daddy, it is to you that God said, no. <laughs> God said, you should go. We will stay here and pray for you. <laughs> so my wife said, I'm going with you. And then three of my pastors decided to, yes. So five of us left Yaoundé and we traveled to the north. Chief, with fear in our belly. You know, in that trip of 2015 to the north, I, I learned a good lesson of what a courageous man is. You know, the difference between a courageous man and a, and a coward, no, not before the difference, Courage, a courageous man and a coward have a common ground is that they all fear. The difference is that after they get scared, the courageous man will still wake up and do what he has to do. The coward, when he gets scared, will either faint or run away. But a courageous person, when he gets scared, will say, if I have to die, if I perish, I will perish, I will still have to go. So we went on that journey with fear in our stomachs. We knew we couldn't come back. Was, there was a possibility that we would not come back. Those guys would uh, adopt us and take us to the bush and kill us or a, a bomb would explode while we are praying around. But we went, we said goodbye to the brethren and told them, if we don't come back, please continue. Keep seeking the Lord until he shows up. So we went on this journey, travel on that red zone. For days, we travel everywhere, praying, building altars, and cursing the works of these evil men, and pushing back the walls of killings and the havoc that they were causing in the north. We finished the mission, thank God, and we all came back alive. Now, we were in the train, traveling back to Yaoundé. Early morning at 4 a.m., I had gotten up. Because I had taken the habit of get, waking up before my house. I tell men, especially the husbands, when the Bible says that the man is the head of the home, it's not just so that you take the biggest seat and get the biggest meat. Your headship in your home, you, must, you lead your home by example. You have to go ahead of them so that they see the example in you. So every day in our home, I make sure I wake up before everybody. Before I wake up, I wake my wife up. I had prayed at least one hour before I wake her up. By the time she's waking up, my engine is already hot. 
When she wakes up, she sees the lion vibrating. So I, in the train that morning, I woke up early, one hour before the normal prayer time. Normal prayer time was five. By four o'clock, I was up. I was on my knees praying. And as I was praying, he spoke to me. That same voice came. He says, rise up. Go to the United States of America to a city called Ashland. Because there I want to talk to you. When he said that, she was lying down on her bed by me. I woke her up. I said, darling, the Lord says I should go to Ashland, to the United States of America, because he wants to talk to me there. And she said, but go. So with, I took my phone and called my, my staff in the U.S. And I said, the Lord is sending me on a retreat and he's sending me to a place I don't know. I don't know where Ashland is. I never heard of Ashland. Been going to the States, to the U.S. now for many, many years. But I've never heard of Ashland, never been there. So I called them and they said, Daddy, there's, Ashland is somewhere in, in Virginia. Give us some time and we'll get back to you. Shortly after that, they called back and said, where we've called Ashland, there's a prayer ground in Ashland, a, a campground. And there's, they even have their summer camp that is beginning in, a, in three days to come. So they said they can host you for seven days. I said, please book for me, I'm coming. So we did the booking. Three days after that, I was ready to go. Mama Dina, the night I was packing my things, we bought just one ticket. I was supposed to go alone. It's me that was invited. So I'm packing my bags in my room. And then my wife comes in, pulls her suitcase, and starts packing. <laughs> and then I turned to her and I said, is this a prophetic act or what? <laughs> and she said, my husband, you and I have been going everywhere together. It's always your food and my food. And you mean this time God is inviting you to talk with you and you want to go alone and leave me here? I'm not staying. I said, but you can't go because we don't have budget for you. You haven't bought your ticket and we don't have them. We don't. You remember, it's that time we are not traveling. We are not doing nothing. I mean, like, there's no activity going on. So barely no money coming in. I said, we don't have the budget for you. He said, I know how big your faith is. Between now and tomorrow morning, you will get the ticket for me. So, we, said, we continue packing. While we were packing, a phone call came in. Hey, daddy, how are you? I said, I'm doing well. Uh, and I finished greeting. He said, uh, daddy, can I see you tomorrow? I said, you can't see me tomorrow because I'm going on a retreat. But where are you going to? I'm going to the U.S. The Lord sent me for a retreat. I'm going for seven days. Are you going alone or you're going with mom? I said, no, I'm going alone. Mom can go. Oh, why? Why are you not going with mom? I said, no, your mom can't go because without, she doesn't have a ticket. He said, is it just a ticket matter? I said, uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> he says, and the person says, what if I buy a ticket for her? I said, well, if you buy a ticket for her, then I will go with her. Long story short, we got a ticket. The next day we were in the plane. We went to the U.S., We flew into New York and then straight to Ashland. When we got to Ashland, we, they booked us in and then we were locked up for seven days. We were only coming out in the evenings because every evening they will have worship time and then a man of God will come and preach the word or bless them. So all day we were in our rooms praying. You know, God says he's going to talk to us. So you don't even want to go to the restroom. Then he will come and say, I came, I didn't see <laughs> We will stay locked up in a room and praying and waiting. I'm praying and looking around. Now, Jesus, but before that time, Jesus had already come to my room. In the, the first time he appeared to us physically, and I was there with my wife. It was in the city of Lubumbashi in Congo. We had gone to Congo, right? Lubumbashi in Congo. We had gone to Congo for a conference, and the, the one but last night of the conference, we came back from the conference late in the night, got into our hotel room, just quickly showered and we were ready to go to sleep. He showered first and she was already in bed and then I finished and I was coming out of my, my, my the bathroom and then the Lord was there. The, our room was filled with light and the master was standing right there. And then I got scared and then he said, sit down, I want to talk with you. 
So I sat down and I woke my wife up. She was already sleeping. I woke her up. I said, wake up, we have a guest. And she woke up and we sat by the bed. And the Lord spoke to me from that time. It was almost 10 to 11 p.m. till 4 a.m. I didn't close my eyes that night. Maybe another time I'll tell you that story. You know, the conversation was so intense that day in Congo. At the time, I, you know the Lord cares for us. At the time, he told me, let your wife sleep. She's tired. So I said, Mama, lie down. And she laid down. In that presence, she laid down. Then he said, I will continue with you. I rest. So she laid down by me. And then he continued talking to me. You know, the Lord cares even for the details of our lives. So we, when we went to Ashland, I was expecting that maybe someday he would still appear in the same manner. Seven days we waited in a dry fast. We couldn't even swallow saliva so that you didn't break your... <laughs> seven days. At the end of the seven days, Apostle Gideon, he didn't come. There was nothing particular. Except that in the sessions, we had received a few prophecies, but we've seen some visions. But it was, it was too meager for two air tickets <laughs> and a long flight to the U.S. If you, if you, have, ever flown, if you have ever flown to the U.S. in, in summertime, that's, we are talking about June, June July. It's a peak of summer. The tickets are, you know... We bought our tickets, it was almost 4 million safer. 4 million safer is like 5 million naira. That was like plenty of money for that season of, you know, where there was no money at all. So seven days after he didn't show up, he didn't, there was nothing spectacular about our coming to the U.S. So on the seventh day, at midday, we decided to break our fast because we we're going to fly the next day. We we're going to fly back to Cameroon the next morning. We prayed, concluded our fast. We were a little bit disappointed, especially my wife. <laughs> and she asked me, but now we have come, so how are we going back? What will we tell the brethren that we came to do? I said, we will tell them we obeyed the voice of the Lord and we came. He is the boss. If he has changed his mind, we can't query God for changing his mind. So we prayed and then we finished our retreat. He said, let me go to the kitchen and prepare a little meal so that we get something in the stomach before we fly back to Cameroon. He went to the kitchen and then I went to the administration of the camp to sign out. Because when you come in, you sign in and before you go, you have to sign out because when you leave, they allocate the room to someone else. So I went to the administration and I, I, I thanked them for their great hospitality, sign out, and then I asked the the, 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 the the, the, the pastor in charge, the director of the camp, to pray for us. And she prayed. It's an elderly lady. She prayed for us. I said, thank you. And I left the, room, the, 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 the office. I was at the veranda outside. And then he came now. And he said, Nyango, did you come here by yourself or I'm the one that asked you to come? I said, you are the one that asked me to come. And then he said, if I'm the one that asked you to come, why did you go sign out without my permission? Surprise. I like, was I still supposed to ask for your permission? You know that we came here for seven days. <laughs> you know, sometimes we get so logical with God, right? He's our. I said, Lord, was I supposed to be asking for your permission again? You know that we came here for seven days, and today is the seventh day. And by the law of this camp, you know, the, the camp where I went, we went to in Ashland, the law says if you, if you came from out of the US, United States, they could host you for. Maximum seven days. If you came from US or Canada, it's three days. Because the demand is great. Thousands of people coming from all over the world to pray. So I told God, was I supposed to ask for your permission? You know that the law here is seven days. And today is a seven day and our flight is being for tomorrow morning six. So, then he said to me, in a very sarcastic, he says, if I am the one that asked you to come, what I asked you to come for has not even started. <laughs> so you have the choice to either stay here and obey me or go back to Cameroon and do your ministry. 
And then he left. Man of God, I have never been this embarrassed. <laughs> if it was in Nigeria, I would say, well, between us African brothers, you can explain that I came for two days and now the Lord is leading me to stay longer. You know, my Nigerian brothers will understand. My African brothers will understand. But you know this, those people over there? <laughs> so, this is me, confused. I don't know if I... And I told God, but if you didn't want me to go, why didn't you talk to me before I signed out? Now I have signed out. This is the paper in my hand. He wasn't there to hear me. To cut the long story short, but at the end of that day, he said, you stay here till further notice. You are going nowhere. You stay here till further notice. We went to Iceland for seven days. We stayed there three months. <laughs> leaving our five children back in Cameroon, leaving the brethren. They were, you, know, you know the kind of crazy ideas that people will have, right? Oh, now nah, surely they have fallen bush. They are no more coming. They will no more come back. But we knew that they were looking for, surely they were looking for opportunity to go to America. Now they have gone. But well, people have that kind of crazy idea. But we, were, we have been, we were used to going to America. I mean, we've been going there for more than a decade before this happened. So, so we went for seven days. We stayed three months. It's in that three months bracket that I was raptured to heaven three times. So we changed our program. I had to go back to the administration and tell them, see. This is what has just happened to me. This is what the Lord is saying. And I told the, the, the director of the camp, the woman of God, I told her, I know that you know God. So ask him if what I'm telling you is true. <laughs> and, and when I was talking to her, she, she was smiling. She said, I don't need to ask him. I said, why? He said, because when I was praying for you, he said to me, he asked me to tell you that it wasn't yet time for you to go home. That he had not finished. So I stopped the prayer and I looked at your face and I saw that your face was, you was looking to Cameroon. You wanted to go. So I told him, if I tell him, he won't believe me. So you tell him yourself. So she said, I am happy that he spoke to you and you heard his voice. What you heard is right. He said it to me while I was praying for you. So she said, this camp belongs to him. The rules, we made the rules that he is the owner of the camp. So, keep your room until further notice. And I asked her, see, further notice means what? <laughs> she, said, she said to me, if he keeps you here for 10 years, we will host you for 10 years. So I said, thank you, and I went back to the room. When I went back to my room, my wife was waiting for me. She had to cook the, the meal. And I said, see, Ad, we are not going. She said, you, you like crazy jokes. <laughs> This is, not, this is not a time and a place to joke. I said, the, the big man up there says, we are not going. And I told her the story. And she began to cry. She said, you men, you don't understand what it means to leave your children and leave your house. And I said to her, you know, what you did following me to this place is, is what my people in the north call Karambani. <laughs> Do you know what Karambani Anybody here know? Now, for, those, for the sake of those of you, Karambani means getting into a matter that is not your own. I said, you are crying now and thinking, it is me that was invited. You decided to follow me. Now that the one that invited me is asking me to stay, you are crying that you are a mother, you have children. I said, don't worry, I understand you. Tomorrow morning, I will escort you to the airport. I will make sure you are in the plane. Go home, take care of the children, take care of the family. I will stay here and wait. And she told me, she asked me the same question. So when he says to Father Nancy, what does that mean? I say, it means that I can stay here for 10 years. <laughs> when I said that, she started beating me. She said, You look, you, I'm, I'm serious. Are you? I said, the Father Nancy means until he changes his mind, this is where we will be. So I asked her, what do you, what do you, you want to go or you want to stay? At the end of the day, she decided, I'm staying with you. I said, okay, if you're staying with me, let's stay and wait. Now, see, the next morning, when we left Cameroon, we had taken a bit of money. We had $1,000 in our pocket. You don't go to America empty-handed, you know. Even if you're on a retreat, when you leave the, your retreat ground, you pass through the... You don't want to come back to Africa with empty boxes. 
So we had kept some money that at least we'll buy a few things for the children before coming home. The next morning, after he changed our plan and now we are no more going, we are now here till further notice and we don't know for how long. We came to the altar to pray because every morning we kept our tradition of coming to pray five to seven. Five to seven, we will come to the, the, to the temple. Nobody is there, we, just the two of us. We will kneel down and pray. That morning, when we came, knelt down, while we were praying, he whispered to me, he said, the money in your pocket, take it all and put it in the offering basket. I stopped the prayer and I told her, he says all the money that we have, we should put in the offering basket. And then she looked at me and said, you, you are a crazy man. <laughs> I've decided to follow you. I'm following you. Everywhere you are leading me, I will be, I'm behind you. So I took out the money. I said, let's agree. We prayed, agreed, and put it in the offering basket. Now, we, have, we don't have an etiquette to go home, and we don't have money. And mama, listen to this. He says, throughout your stay here, don't call anybody. So three months locked up in that camp. We have friends across America, but we can't call anyone. We can't even text. I'm, I'm sharing all these details with you to tell you, to show you the demands for encounters. See, God does not show himself to casual seekers. He doesn't show himself to the people that seek him when it's convenient. As a matter of fact, Great encounters will almost always take place out of your comfort zone. If you are not ready to shift out of your comfort zone, you are not ready for... Am I talking to somebody? So we stayed. So it is one week after he changed our program. Now the night of the 3rd of July, we were in the sanctuary in the evening at the time of worship. You know, their temple is big, big, I mean, bigger than. And they have created a space in front of the altar. They call it the river of God. When we, every time we came for service, they do the opening prayer, and then everybody will leave their seats, and then we come, to the, in front, we come in front. That's where praise and worship takes place. Everybody worships God in the river, in, the, in front of the altar. So that night, as usual, we were at the altar. That day, we have a friend of ours, Prophet Rich Daniel and the wife, the white guys from, tech, from New York. They, they, flew, they came from New York that day to meet us. As a matter of fact, when we landed in New York, it is Prophet Rich Daniel and the wife that welcomed us from the airport and helped us get to Ashland. Now, they knew we came for seven days. When our program changed, we told them, hey, we are no more flying at the days that we told you because the Lord has changed our program. So they didn't get that. It didn't sound very good. <laughs> I don't know how it sounded in their ears. So on that 3rd of July, that was the eve of the National the Independence Day in America. They decided to come and, and see us and understand why we were no more going back at our date. So we were there. I was there with Rich Darnell and the wife, my wife and I, and the other people, I mean thousands of people, who were singing and dancing and praising the Lord. And in the, in the middle of the music, all of a sudden I stopped, lifted out of my eyes, and heard me say something that I did not plan. It's not me that was talking because the things I said were never in my mind. I heard me say a prayer. Lord, since I have been serving you and working with you, you have never taken me to where you live. Now, I must tell you that for the, for the three years that we've been fasting and praying, going to heaven was never in our plan. In fact, it was not one of the expectations. We knew that the Lord would come. We didn't know how, but we just knew that someday in the middle of our prayer, the Lord will appear. So I heard me say that prayer, and as soon as I, in fact, I just barely finished saying that sentence, I was on the floor. I fell, and then I found myself walking with an angel. We walked on a long road, on a long stretch, on some hundreds of meters, and then a staircase appeared from nowhere, and then we started climbing the, sta the, the stairs. The angel was on my left. Then climbing and climbing, we climbed and got in front of a big white gate, like an automatic door. The angel got close to the door, the door opened, the angel entered. I entered after him and the door closed behind us. It is after the door closed behind us that I realized I have just made it to heaven. You know, the interesting thing is, when that happened to me up there, 
The Lord opened the eyes of the wife of my friend, Prophet Rich Dan, that came from New York. And she saw me enter. And then she turned to my wife and said, you see my brother lying here? He's no more here. I just saw him. He's just crossed the gate. Now he's into heaven. And when he, she said that to my wife, <laughs> she will tell you the rest of the story. <laughs> Suddenly she lost her, quiet, her calm. And she said to herself, I know my husband. If this guy sees Jesus where he is gone, he will no more come back here. <laughs> and if he doesn't come back, what will I do? Where will I start? What will I tell his children and his family? As a matter of fact, here we are with no money. We got the thousand dollars that we had in our pockets. We put it in the offering basket. So, and he said we should not call anybody. So if he, if he doesn't come back. Now you can imagine what can go on in the mind of a woman. So that night, I was taken up by, at 8 p.m. It was 8 p.m. on the church clock when I was taken up to heaven. And I came back at 3 a.m. the following day. So I stayed, according to Kronos time, I stayed there seven hours. So when we crossed the gate, we entered the city. A beautiful city. Oh my God. See, if you miss heaven, it was better you were never born. <laughs> Apostle Gideon, what I saw up there, America looks like a trash. See, from the time I went to heaven and came back, I don't, I don't do sightseeing because there's nothing to see in this world. Every, I travel across the globe. I mean, everywhere. I do airport, hotel, conference ground, hotel, airport. When I enter my hotel room, I don't want to see anything. I don't want to do anything. I don't want to go anywhere. I, don't, I only want to go and talk to people when I finish, come back to my room. I want to stay with him. I want to, you know, sometimes when I travel, especially when I go to Europe, America, and all this, my children will go and beg their mother and say, please, follow your husband, go. Because if you don't go, he will come back with testimonies. He doesn't do shopping. And we need some things. <laughs> so they will beg mama to go with me so that in between two sessions, he can go. And that's okay. See, the city I saw. Now, this, when I entered, when the gate Close behind us, I was found in this city, beautiful city. The words in English are not adequate to articulate and describe what I saw. The streets are completely gold, pure gold. It's not a figure of speech, it's real. The houses, the flowers, the beauty of the colors, I can't describe. I mean, the when I saw it, my eyes came out of their orbits. I, I, was like, I was looking around. I was walking with the angel. Now see, when we entered the city, we were not walking there like we, we were floating. Like, you know, if you've been to like big airports around the world, you, they have this rolling carpet where you stand and then you just, like we were floating. The angel was by my left and I was looking around. Beautiful city, I mean beautiful. They were, they were not light like this, but it was lighted. It was bright. I was looking around, and I saw nobody. I thought I would see some people that I know that have gone ahead of us. I saw nobody. And after we walked like 200 meters or more, then we suddenly stopped, and we had a light. You see what Paul was describing in the text? That bright light. Brighter than the sun. The one I saw... The sun is nothing compared to it. It's like the sun, when it shines at the zenith like 10 times. I closed my eyes and I told the angel. That was the first time I spoke to the angel that was with me. I told the angel, please, can you ask the driver of this light to, to dim his light because he's blinding me off? Because in my mind, that was the only reference I had, like a, an oncoming vehicle that has flashed his full light. In, the light was so bright that 
with my eyes closed, I could feel the light inside. I was literally becoming blind. And the angel spoke back to me and said, Nyangok, what you are seeing in front of you is not a car. We are in front of the throne room. And the light that you are seeing is the reflection of the glory of the Father. The fear sank into me. Then I asked him, so what should I do? Then he said, look around you and do exactly what you see the 24 elders do. So I bowed my head, opened my eyes. I mean, I could barely open my eyes because of the brightness of the light. And somewhere, like where the brother in the black shirt is sitting, they were lying on their faces. They had long white robes with golden stripes, with a golden belt on their waist. They had, with their arms stretched, they had removed their golden crowns that they had thrown on the ground at the foot of the throne, and they were on their faces worshiping. So I did the same, laid down, and stretch my arm at their feet. I stretched my arm like I saw them do. And that night, I was caught up in the mass choir of heaven. I experienced a level of worship that I had never heard anybody talk about. See, that night, I had the impression that in my belly, I had all kinds of musical instruments. Heavenly melodies were coming out of my belly effortlessly. I wasn't, in fact, I wasn't in control of what was going on. I was like, I was, the, the, my happiness was in capital letters. I mean, at the, at, the ap, at the apex, I was, you think you are happy when you get money and when you get stuff? Forget. My happiness was at the summum. See, this time of worship, see, if the only thing we do in heaven for eternity is just to worship the master, nobody will get bored. While this worship was going on in my mind, because I was fully conscious, and what I'm telling you is not a dream. See, when that night in Ashland, my body laid on the altar, I mean, there in front of the altar, for all the time of the service, the service that night ended around 11 p.m. When they finished, they, they carried me. Some brethren came and helped Prophet Rich Daniel and my wife carried me back to the room. I was not dead. Like, I was, tears were rolling down my eyes and I was breathing, but I was not there. When they took me back to the room, my wife said she pinched me. They tried to wake, maybe she thought I was sleeping or something, tried to wake me up. Tears were rolling down, and then I was breathing. That was that were the only signs that I was alive. But I wasn't there. Now, what I'm telling you here is not a dream. It's not like I was, I was there alive. See, that day I understood the difference between the, the spiritual man and the physical man. See, this what you see here is the box in which the real man lives. The man inside is exactly like this, just that he's not material. He has a nose, he has hands, he has mouth, he has mind, he has everything. Remember the rich man in hell lifted up his eyes. His body was in the grave. He lifted up his eyes, saw Abraham, and recognized Lazarus. No? His mind was still there. He, his memory was not lost. See, while I was there, in my mind, I was like, Lord, I pray that this worship doesn't stop. I didn't want the worship to end. I wanted to stay there forever. Now, at the, at the sound of the music, because of the brightness of the light, I couldn't open my eyes. But at the sound of the music, you could tell that we were thousands upon thousands around the throne worshiping the Father. Now see, when we came into the city, we came through the, north, uh, the, the west gate and we were facing the east. We were going this direction. So I was lying down like this at the foot of the 24 elders that were laid that, around the throne. Now, during the worship, I had the impression that something was making us go around the throne. I couldn't see anything. I was just enjoying the moment, like worshiping the master. And you know, the symphony, the harmony of the music, the sound. Oh, my God. See, if, it, if it, I'm begging you in the name of the Lord, you must make it to heaven. You, you can't understand why, why, what Paul said when he says, I, take, I put my body under severe constraint. 
Until, until you have seen this. You know, you can justify why you live in sin, why you do some things, like he was saying. You know, un, until you have seen this, you can give yourself excuses. When you see how harsh Paul is with himself and with others, you cannot understand it until you have lived this. So, when the worship ended, after a long while, I don't know how many hours, but it was long enough. When it stopped, I opened my eyes. The angel that was leading me was still by my left. Now see, when we came in, we came in through this gate and we were facing this direction. When the worship ended, I was lying this side. I had not gotten up, but I was lying this side, facing that other direction. Now on this side where I was, the light was not as bright as it was on the other side where I was in first, uh, previously. So I opened my eyes. The angel was on my left. And then the great white throne was above my head. Mounted on a chariot. It, the, this chariot had six wings. Big, I mean six wheels. And the six wheels were like long tunnels, long deep tunnels. So I... Lay, lying down on the ground, I tried to turn my head because I only saw the, the throne on the side. Now, I wanted to see who is the one seated on the throne. Turning my eyes, the throne was filled with this, surrounded with this light that my eyes could not support. So, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't peep into it because the light was too bright for my eyes. Now, I looked into the tunnel and I saw another city on the other side. Now, we came through this gate. There was the first city here. Looking into the tunnel, I saw another city. This one even more beautiful than the first. So I told the angel, can you permit me get through into the tunnel to go visit the city on the other side? He first said no. And after he insisted, he said, exceptionally, I will let you in. So I got into the tunnel to, with a mind to go and visit the city on the other side. When I got into the city, the tunnel, I took a few steps in, and then I heard a voice telling me, Nyangok, it's been three years that you, have, you guys are fasting and praying because you want to see God. This is him seated, seated above your head, and you want to walk past him to go visit, I don't know what, on the other side. <laughs> and then I said to myself, yes, it's, it's true. I don't know what curiosity is, is this. So I changed my mind and I laid in the, tr in the tunnel. And when I laid in the tunnel, I started thanking God. My heart was full of God. You know, like, wow. And I began to say to myself, these things that I have read in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, talking about the great white throne, the streets of heaven paved with gold, and the thrones, the, the, the 24 elders, they are thrones, they are crowns. And I mean, these are the things, I, I'm seeing them here. So this Bible is not one book that some white people wrote somewhere and brought to Africa. You know, while I was being grateful to God for having this, for living all this and experiencing all this, and I was saying to myself, how many men of God on the earth have had the privilege of getting to this place to see this? While I was in, in that Thanksgiving mood, suddenly I heard my name in a loudspeaker, Nyangok. And I knew exactly where, who was the one calling. You know, when we get to heaven, we will not need a tour guide. Because you will know everything. See, what, now I don't know your names. But when we meet up there, I will know you. I will know your name. I will call you by your name. I will remember that you were in Makodi. Because knowledge is made perfect up there. So when I heard the voice, I knew the voice. Nyangog! And I answered, yes, Lord. And he asked me, did you see the city when you came through the gate? I said, yes. And then he said, that's why I brought you here. I brought you here to tell you three important things. Now, this, it is at this point that my discourse with the Lord now began. I am lying down under the tunnel. And he's sitting up there on the, the big white throne. He said, I brought you here to tell you three important things. Number one, I brought you here to show you that the city that Jesus came to prepare for the saints is now ready. I said, yes. The second thing, 
He said, the second coming of the Lord Jesus to rapture the church is more than imminent, but the church on the earth is not ready. I said, yes. Then he now told me the third thing that was the more, the, the more crucial and more critical thing. And that's when I began to weep. He said to me, if the trumpet of the rapture was to sound today, only a tiny minority of the people that call themselves Christians on the earth will be raptured. And I began to cry and I asked him why. Why only a tiny percentage? I mean, when he said tiny percentage, he talked about very small. And I said, why? When we look at our nations and our cities, we see churches springing up every day, thousands and thousands. There are more pe many more people today going to church than they, we had 30 years back. In Cameroon, in Nigeria, and everywhere in the world, mega, mega ministries, mega churches have sprung up from all over the nations. Many more Christian television online. Online, you have all kinds of Christian television, Christian radio broadcasting, quote, in quote, some good news, right? And when you see these multitudes coming to church, we have the impression that there's some kind of revival going on. So I ask Lord, but when I see all these churches coming up and mega, mega ministries that are springing up with thousands of people thronging into the church, how can you tell me that just a tiny percentage? And he said, Nyango, do not be seduced by this multitude you see thronging in my house. They are not coming for me. They are not interested in me. They don't know me. It's not me they want. They come into my house for the things I give. And I said, Lord, but when they come for the things, you give them the things. He said, yes. I give them the things because I'm a generous God. And he says, in my nature as a generous God, I give lavishly and I give without restraint and I give to all men. He said, Nyango, be careful. I am not just good to Christians. I am good to all men. And I do not only give to church people. I give to all men. And the proof is that God causes his son to rise every day for the righteous and even the unrighteous. He causes rain to fall. When it rains in Makodi, it doesn't just fall. It doesn't just rain in the fields of the Christians. Does it? It rains for everyone. God is good to all men, not only to Christians. And I began to weep. And then, see, one of the things I learned and it will interest you as ministers. One of the things I learned in my first visit to heaven, Apostle, I learned about God's jealousy. He said to me, in my nature as a generous God, I give. You know, Paul wrote to the Romans, he said, do not consider the goodness of God. That the goodness of God leads you to what? Repentance. God is good to all men so that they can see him and repent. Then he showed me a scripture in the Bible that I had never seen all my life. Exodus 34 verse 14. This text says, For thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. The Lord, whose name is Jealous, one of the names of God is Jealous. See, before I went to heaven, I thought my wife was jealous. <laughs> Papa, when I, when I came back from this encounter, my wife's jealousy times 100 is anywhere, nowhere close to the jealousy of God. He says, in my nature as a generous God, I give to all men and I don't look at their faces. I don't look at the colors of their, their skin. I just give. But in my nature as a jealous God, I do not tolerate any rival. I do not tolerate cohabitation. And I do not share. And I said, Lord, what does that mean? And he said to me, listen to this. He said, whenever there is a, a situation of cohabitation in the heart of any of my children between me and any other thing, guess what I do? I'll quietly tiptoe out of the scene. And the person will not even know that I have left. That's the day I understood the scripture that says, examine yourselves if you are still in the faith. 
See, we can, you can be in this movement doing what we do, especially we the ministers, and you think he is still there when it is a long time he left you. Apostle, the fact that God does not repent of his callings and of his gifting is a great trap for us men of God. See, chances are it's just a gifting and a calling that is manifesting. But God himself is not, it's gone a long time. And if you just want to do ministry, you can have a successful ministry on the earth without God. See, you can be a great, mighty man of God on the earth without God. I'm coming. See, I cried all my tears that day. All my tears. See, it's in my nature as a judge. No. Apostle Gideon, look at the jealousy of God. He says, eh, if any man puts his hand to the plow and does what? Looks back. He is unworthy. See, it's not like you have stopped plowing for him. You are still plowing. Your hand is on the plow. You have not left the plow. You are still there. The moment you turn your head, he writes on your back, unworthy. Many great men of God having worldwide ministries with a mark on their back, unworthy. Not fit for the kingdom of God. That's how jealous God is. See, Apostle, and this, you know, I like, I was so blessed by what you said. The demand for ministry. In this work that we are doing, there is no place for ambition. There's no room for um, human and amb personal ambition. Until you are dead to your dreams and your ambitions, and you only live for him alone, you are not fit. See, some, one day I was in one country that I will not name, and I was talking to the pastors, to the ministers. And you know, I look at them, and, and I was talking, and then I told them, see, when I look at your faces, I don't see, me, I don't, I don't see the call of God on you. What I see, what I see in front of me is a group of young, ambitions, ambitious men. They got angry. They almost stoned me. They had to ab ab abduct me from the hall, put me in the car, drive me back to the hotel, and keep me for two hours for those guys to calm down. And I told them, it's the truth. When I see you, see, most of you, God didn't call you. What, what happened to you is that you saw one big man of God, quote, unquote, now I'm using big quotes. You know, you saw how affluent they were, how popular they were, how rich they were, and an ambition was born in your heart, and you called it ministry. If you know the risen Messiah, see all this bragging and all this big name and big, you know, he will die in you. I mean, when you see him, look into his eyes, all of that will die in you. Some of you, what you want is the protocol, you know, the, the, you know, the privileges. You are not dead inside. You are not dead. In fact, you are serving see that ambition. It's not ministry. It's not God you are serving. It's, it's an ambition you are following. And I can say it here with all sense of apostolic responsibility, especially in Nigeria. We have all this mega, mega, the papas and the everything. You know, we created a kind of thing that is making everybody to dream. The whole world is coming to Nigeria to learn the art of making this, all this. The reason Messiah has no fellowship with that. Eh? The day you meet him, ask him.
if you put your hand to the plow, what are you looking behind for? Until you have come to the place where the only thing that you want to do is him. When I was listening to the man of God yesterday. Now, see, the man Paul, who said I wasn't disobedient to the heavenly vision, he was a professor. I mean, a, an erudite, a learned. He was a friend of the governors, of the high priests, of all these, of his days, right? When he met the Messiah, when this heavenly vision sunk into him, the rest of his life was in between prisons, shipwreck, beatings, chains, famine, stoning. And when the believers will be heartbroken because of it, he said, this is the glory I'm talking about. See, the real apostles of the Messiah, they carry the marks. They are, the marks of the apostles are not the, the, the private jets. Thank God if we have them. But that's not the mark of an apostle. Well, let me come back to the story. The time is finished, my God. Okay, we'll stop and continue tomorrow. And I said, he said, I said, but you said only a tiny minority. He said, yes. And I said, why? He said, because the church on the earth is full of idolatry. And he said to me, even in your church. And I said, no, Lord. In our church, there's no idolatry. He said, yes, there's idolatry in your church. And I said to him, if there is idolatry in our church, then you and I don't have the same definition of what idolatry is. So, Lord, please, what do you call idolatry? He said to me, the idolatry that is in the church today is in the heart of my people. It's not just the conventional idolatry of people worshiping trees and mountains and rivers. The idolatry that is in the church today is in the heart of my people. And that idolatry is being sponsored and nurtured by you, the pastors. And he was pointing to me. I said, you, the pastors. And he said, for your, by, for your information, I am not happy with you and your brothers. And I asked him, Lord, what have we done? To sponsor this idolatry that is in the church. He said, you are responsible for the idolatry because you have abandoned the preaching of the true message of the gospel. And I asked him, Lord, what do you call the true message of the gospel? He said, the true message of the gospel is Christ and him crucified and nothing else. If everything you are telling the people in your congregation is not pointing them to Christ and him crucified, you are an entertainer. You are a storyteller. You are not a messiah. You are not a messiah's servant. And he said, it is you, the pastors, that have taken the eyes of my people from the cross. And you've taken them to the supermarkets and showed them how good it is to have money. And, how. and you know, while he was talking to me, I was hearing his voice, hearing what he was telling me, and I had the impression there was a giant screen that was projecting everything that he was saying. You know, while he was talking to me, he said, look at this man of God. It's been more than 30 years that he's preaching, but he's not talking about me. And I look at the guy, and he's a pastor that I know of a country that I will not tell you. And he was doing a good job. I prophesy, if you say men like thunder, and the people will shout, for more than 30 minutes, Jesus says, see, for 30 minutes now he's been talking. He's showing them things that they will get, but he's not showing them me. You know, the breakthrough and prosperity preaching, we show the people what they will get from God, but we don't show them God. So they don't know God. They come to church as coming to the supermarket and they're coming to get stuff. They come for breakthrough. They come for pro prosperity. They come for promotion. They do all kinds of gimmicks. They sow seed. All these we do. We do that in church. People get excited, but they came to the service. They, there was no moment in our preaching when we showed them the Christ. He said, you are the one responsible for the idolatry in the church. And I said, Lord, up until now, you haven't told me exactly what idolatry is. Listen to his definition. I will say that and then we'll stop. 
We'll continue tomorrow. Well, maybe in the evening. He said, idolatry is anything whatsoever that fights for space and attention with God in your life. And I asked him, Lord, say that in basic English. Like, say it, break it down so that I'll, I, I'm sure I'm understanding exactly what you're saying. He said to me, if there is anything in your life that you love as much as you love God or more than you love God, that thing is an idol. And God does not share his glory with idol. In fact, he, apostle, God doesn't share space with idols. That's why I told you, if there's anything like ambition in your heart, you are in your movie alone. You, what you are doing, what you call your ministry, whatever be the name, or how big it is. You see the, the guy, the pastor of the church called the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. Even Jesus didn't match his, his record. I mean, the only pastor on the earth that succeeded to rally the whole human race in a project. If Jesus lived in the same time with that guy, he, I'm not sure he would even be a deacon in that church. But as big as he was, God wasn't in it. That's for you who think when it's big, it means God. Big is means God. He said, I don't share space with idols. And God knows that in our hearts, our hearts are full of all those ambitions. Anything that you love as much as you love God or more than you love God. Anything that you, you, you pay greater allegiance to than you give to God. See, as I, as I end this session, I want you to go back inside. What is the driving force behind what you are doing? I haven't finished. This is halfway into the conversation. In the evening, we'll continue. But what is the driving force? In fact, I want you, when you go for a break, sit down and revisit the foundation of your calling. What is it that happened when you said yes, that you will serve God? Some of you, if you are honest enough, you will discover there was no call. It was just... Something, something happened. Something triggered that ambition, that dream, that thing you are pursuing that you call the call to ministry. Shall we stand? Please, in a few seconds, lift your holy hands. Okay, sit down. <laughs> They've just extended. Thank you, Apostle. So he said to me, idolatry is anything whatsoever that competes with God in your heart. Anything that you love as much as you love God or more than you love God is called idolatry. So if you look at it with these eyes, our churches are temples of idols. People come to church not to meet with the Messiah. They come to receive visas. They come for financial breakthrough. They come for blessings. They come for... They have no personal relationship with the risen Lord. They don't even know him. They don't care about him. See, so that you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. In John chapter 6, John's gospel chapter 6, Jesus had just multiplied bread and the crowd was 5,000 men without counting the women and the children. The theologian says there were, there were about 30 to 40,000 human beings in that place when Jesus multiplied bread. When they finished eating, they saw the miracle, they finished eating the bread, they were happy. They decided to make Jesus their king. Am I right? When Jesus heard that they were talking about making him their king, he sneaked out and disappeared. 
And they looked for him until they went and found him in a solitary place. When Jesus saw them come again, he said, okay, since you want me to be your king, sit down, I will explain. Except you are willing to eat my flesh and drink my blood. You remember John 6? That's one of Jesus' longest sermon. And when Jesus began to explain what it takes for him to be our king, the people started walking out. And Jesus wasn't preaching that sermon with his eyes closed. His eyes were open. He saw them go out one after the other until that mammoth crowd left the place. They all went. When the last person walked out of the auditorium, Jesus turned to the 12. He said, hey, the door is here. You can also go. Then Peter spoke out and said, to whom else shall we go? You are the one that have the words of eternal life. See, in that crowd of about 30 to 40,000 people, only 11 people, because there were 12, and you know that Judas will follow the crowd too, right? <laughs> only 11. So, the issue is not the mega church. It's not how many thousands you are sitting on Sunday. That's why I told you, in heaven, heaven doesn't consider big man as God doesn't use the same measuring rod, doesn't use the same standards of measuring. For Jesus, that crowd was just 11 people. Of all these people, this multitude that came to eat bread for, fi- for free and fish for free, only 11 people had found a way to eternal life. So the question is, in the ministry that you are running, the church that you are running, how many of them have met the Messiah? How many of them know him to be the way of, to eternal life? Or are they just coming for blessing? Abraham's blessings are mine. No? We sing our blessings, we dance our blessings, we prophesy our blessings, but we don't, we don't know him. So he said, it is you, the pastors, that are responsible for this. He told me, I'm not happy with you, and I want you to go everywhere and tell the ministers I'm not happy with them. We have hijacked the bride of Christ. He says, I'm angry with you because your congregations know you more than they know me. They are more loyal to you than they are loyal to me. In fact, they don't even see me. Why? Because you have never let them know me and see me. The anointing of the man of God is greater than God himself. So people are, they pledge allegiance to a system, to a man who is supposed to be of God, but they have no clue of who that God is. And Jesus is talking to me with tears in his eyes. See, while he was talking to me, he, another man of God appeared on the screen. I said, do you know this man? I said, I know him. He's a man of God. And then he said, look at the man very caref- carefully. And when I looked the second time, the man became transparent in my eyes. And in the man's heart was filled with all kinds of ambitions. He's running mega ministries across the globe. He said, look at him. Jesus was standing behind, in, in, on that screen, Jesus was standing behind him. He says, it's a long time since him and I are separated, and he doesn't even know. He's still doing ministry, traveling everywhere, preaching, laying hands, people are falling. Miracles are even taking place. But this man is not working with me, I don't know him. We are, we are separated, it's been many years, he's not aware. And Jesus said, if the rapture took place now, he will not be raptured. And there are many like him in the church. I began to, I mean, I cried so much. And then Jesus said, come, I will show you something. Are you ready for this? He took me and we came to the earth. From one continent to another, from church to church. We will come to a church and stand outside at the window, looking inside. They are having church. The, the anointing is flowing. Miracles are taking place. The crowd is big. But Jesus is not there and they don't even know it. See, our nations are filled with Christless churches. And the people inside don't even know that the Lord is not there. I remember this particular church. Jesus and I are standing outside looking, looking into the church and they, did not, they were not seeing us, but we were seeing them. The, that particular congregation, I mean, was huge, 
from this platform, you couldn't see the end of the crowd. And while the pastor was talking or preaching, they rushed in a man that had had an accident and was amputated of his two legs. They dropped him on the platform and the man of God, quote unquote, held the legs, the amputated legs of this guy and commanded them to grow. And the man, the legs grew under the eye of the camera. The man stood up and started running on the platform. People were fainting and falling under. And I cried the more and I told Jesus, no, you have to explain this to me. He said, yes, I brought you to see this so that I can explain. And he said, listen, number one, it is written in your Bible that in the last days, many will come and say, we prophesied in your name. We cast out devils in your name. We work miracles in your name. And I will tell them, depart from me, you who, you workers of iniquity. Listen, for I never known you, never. So the question is, the Jesus they were casting the devils out with, who's, which Jesus was that? If this Jesus would tell them he had never known them, and they were using one Jesus to cast out devils, which Jesus was that? Now, Apostle Paul would say, 2 Corinthians 11 verse 4, he said, if someone else came and presented you another Jesus than the one we have presented to you, if, uh, if, for if he that cometh preached another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if he ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So Paul is the one telling us that in the church setting, what we call the church, there are many Jesus, many gospels, many spirits. So the question is, the one you receive, is it the true Jesus or is it another Jesus? The gospel you heard the day you, you came to church, was it the gospel that you heard or you heard another gospel? Now, if you want to know the difference, you know yesterday the pastor was presenting the book. The, church, the book I wrote on bewitching the church. He's not talking about a witchcraft. He's not talking about the marine spirit. No. I'm talking about, the, I'm just explaining the mystery of the church. In that book, I make the difference between the true Jesus and the other Jesuses. The true gospel and the other gospels and the true spirit of God and the other spirits. See, this kind of pompous, arrogant, you know, uh, uh, showing attitude of the pastors and the men of God of time. It has nothing to do with the true Messiah. He wasn't like that. If you read your Bible, he wasn't like that. Was he like that? See, he never beat his chest on over a miracle or over anything that happened. No. In fact, most of the time, more often than not, he would tell them, shh. He never used it for fundraising. He never used it for publicity. He never used his miracle for anything. If the people will not see the Father, Jesus is not interested. In fact, if he will perform a miracle and he will not let people see the Father, he will sneak out and run. Well, you get more in that book. So what we're talking about the church that is bewitched, we're not talking about witchcraft. The wizards and sorcerers, they can't do that. It is the pastors that bewitch the church. Gal Paul is writing to the Galatians, all oh, you foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? You under whom eyes Christ was painted as crucified. See, Paul presented a crucified Messiah to the Galatians. When Paul moved on with his apostolic mission, some other pastors came, some other apostles came, and they removed the cross. They told the people, this gospel Paul is preaching is too difficult. My friend, this thing is not as hard as Apostle Arume is making it sound. Why must you be fasting this many days and doing? Why must you be under this constraint of holiness and righteousness? Why must you? No, you see, Jesus died, made things easy. You know, the picture that is in most of your minds it's a picture of one God that was in the Old Testament. He was very mean, very an old man with a rod. He would beat on the head of anybody, you know. And unfortunately for, fortunately for us, that old God, one day he died. And his son took over now. And his son is a gentle guy. He doesn't beat anybody. In fact, he, he even went and died on the cross so that your sins will not come. In fact, from the time that that young man died on the cross, sin doesn't exist anymore. 
You, can't, you don't have to confess your sins anymore because it does, God doesn't see it. And once you have said yes to Jesus, once saved, forever saved. So you don't have to guard yourself. You don't have to live under any... That's a picture that most people have in their mind. But you are a million miles away from the true Jesus. Oh, how I wish it was that easy. So let me run. Let me finish. I'm sorry, I can't finish. I'll just conclude. So he says idolatry. He said even in your church. Now when he began to explain idolatry, I said, okay, now I understand. I don't have time to explain, to go to. But you see, we come to church and let me just show you a picture of what idolatry is. We come to church and it's time to give offering to God. It's an offering time, blessing time. Please take your seat and let's worship the Lord. Most of us will just drop anything. But you know, in the same service, if the man of God starts calling your phone numbers and giving them your grandmother's name, now you will sign a check. You just gave 100 naira now when it was offering time. Now when they start prophesying and saying, Tickling the covetousness, the idols that are in your heart. Because the real reason why you are here is not for him. You are here because you want to marry. You want to go to Canada. So if I start prophesying that God just showed me that there's a man, your name is uh, 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 Gideon, and you, you, are, you have applied for Canada and you are waiting, you will remove two million naira and put here. So the real reason why you are here is not because you want to see him. It's because you want Canada. You want, you want the door to Canada to open. So all these Babylonian prophets and apostles, they know it. So what they do is they serve the meal you want to eat. And they are rich. They can be rich. You know, Papa, the Laodicean church eh, became very rich. The time Jesus walked out of that church, they did not even realize that he wasn't there anymore. He was outside and knocking and nobody inside was hearing him. The church was now big. The people inside are rich. They say we are rich and we have become very rich and we need nothing. And Jesus is answering from outside. Say, look at you poor, miserable, and wretched, and blind. Are you with me? Idolatry. So check your heart. Maybe someday when I come back, if the Lord permits, I will tell you more about idolatry. I'm writing a book on what idolatry is, just to expose that to the church. Just as the master showed. If there's anything that you love as much as you love God, or that you are devoted to more than you are devoted to God. See how serious you are on your job. How you are serious on your education. How you will give everything because you want to succeed. Let's see how you don't have time for prayer. You don't have time for quiet time with God. You don't have time. I mean, when it comes to God, you don't have time. You have time for every other thing except for the real thing. You are an idolater. We go to the football stadium and we can stay for four or five hours watching some boys run around. But when you come to church, you are looking at your watch and say, this pastor has been talking now for two hours. Why is, is he not stopping? Because you have more important things to do with your time. See, idolatry, you see it in three, three ways. Look, at, Let me say this quickly. Number one, how you handle your money. How much of your money is given to God? When you go home tonight, please, do this exercise for me. Eh? Check how much of your money is used on God or for God's purposes and God's interest. And do the ratio with how much of it is spent on yourself and on your dreams. That will prophesy, will give you a sure word of prophecy. Because he said, where your treasure is, there also your heart is. So wherever your, the biggest share of your money goes to, that's exactly where your heart is. Don't tell us your heart is for God and most of your money is in the supermarket and is into things. Number two, how you manage your time. How much of your time is given to God per day? If you give more of your time doing Facebook, WhatsApp, and, na -na 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 -na, and going about your things and you don't have time to be with him, don't tell us your heart is with God. It's not. You're an idolater. You just come into church. Oh, if I had time on that, I would tell you more things. Number three, your gifts and your talents. How much
much of them are they devoted to the service of God? Especially you, the musicians. He gave you the voice, but they have to pay you to sing for him. He gave you the skills, but you charge to serve God, to serve God with them. You think he gave them to you as a capital for business? Hallelujah. See, Apostle, after he took me around, you, need, you, you would like to hear this. When he took me around the churches, let me quickly explain. Eh? And I'm crying, I'm sobbing. Like, I can't hold myself. He said, I will explain to you. Sat me down. He said, let me show you idolatry. See, when Israel left Egypt on their way to the promised land, when they crossed the Red Sea, idolatry entered the camp of Israel. Every day they began murmuring, cursing God, cursing Moses, crying for the onions and the concubines of Egypt. True? They worry God with their murmuring and their crying so badly that God in his anger swore that all of these people will not enter his rest. Except for Caleb and Joshua. Am I right? What you may not know is that the day he swore in his anger that they will not enter his rest, God walked away from the camp of Israel. For 40 years, they ate in the desert. He wasn't there with them. I didn't know it. He told me when I was there. He said, I walked out of the camp. The only thing I didn't do, I didn't take away the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. The pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire were still there, moving with them in the desert, but God wasn't there. And he told me, Nyango, be careful. You can have a ministry on earth that has the emblems of God's presence, but not have God himself. See, the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud were the, sign that, the signs of God's presence. They were there until they all died. But God had walked out. It's when I came back from the encounter, Apostle, that I read my Bible. Numbers chapter 14. I think verse 34. Check that for me, please. Numbers 14, 34. After the number of the days in which ye search the land, even 40 days, each day for a year, shall ye bear your iniquities even for 40 years. Now look at the last one. He says what? And ye shall do what? The breach of my... Now your version says the breach of my promise. If you read over that version, it says you will know what it means to be deprived of my presence. He left the pillars... But he himself wasn't there until they all died. When they all died, he came back and said, oh, Joshua, where was it? when was it when we stopped? The last time we stopped. Okay, circumcise their children and let's continue the journey. So you can have all the emblems. Check the version. You got different version. You find the one that says, you will know what it means to be deprived of my presence. Amen. Second thing he showed me, he said, Look at Elijah on the mountain. I think 1 Kings 18 or 19. God brought the wind, but God wasn't in the wind. God brought the fire. God wasn't in the fire. God brought the earthquake. God wasn't in the earthquake. And when all these three had passed, then now he came in a still small voice, spoke to Elijah. True? He said to me, Nyango, you can have an earthquaking ministry on the earth. A consuming fire ministry and a wild wind ministry shaking the whole world, but without God. That's why when the 70 came back in Luke chapter 10 and they gave testimonies of all of it, he said, Shh, are your names written in the book of life? Because today on the earth, there are many workers of iniquity that are great workers of miracles, but God is not with them. And they are taking all these multitudes following them, not to eternity with God. So on, as we were coming, when we finished, he finished explaining that we are coming back. He showed me. I'm telling I'm speaking before the Messiah. You know him, ask him the question. He showed me great, I mean what we call the principalities of this faith. They are still alive. Some of them in this country. And in other places. So you see this one? It's not my servant. You see that one? It's not working for me. I mean, he showed me many of them. When I came
came out, when I came back, now I'm cutting the, I'm concluding my time is finished. But when I came back, I told my wife, and I began to give her names. She said, please don't give me, <laughs> please, please, I don't want to hear that. I said, no, you, you are my covenant. Now, he didn't give me permission to give you the names. That's why I'm not called the names. When I started calling the names, she said, please, I don't want, I said, you need to hear them. She insisted, I, so I said, okay, let me, I will not call the other names. But I'm giving you the name so that when some of the things begin to happen, you will know that I told you. You see? When I came back. Now, before I came back, the last thing. I'm trying to God, my God. Now, Jesus asked me, Nyango, what is this crazy desire in your heart and in the hearts of your colleague, the pastors? for wanting your ministries to grow by all means. Do you want them to grow for you or you want them to grow for me? That question alone was like volumes of volumes of books downloaded in my spirit. You know, we can be involved in this thing and doing it with all passion, but we're not doing it for him. Hallelujah. Let's stand. It's time to pray. I'm not going to give you a prayer point. From what you gathered this morning, you want to talk to God. In the evening, we're going to go a little further. But if God has spoken to you in any way in the short discourse that we've had, I want you to turn what he told you into a prayer point. Yes, I want to hear you pray. It's a time to stop and check yourself. This thing that you are doing, call ministry, who called you into it? Some of you at the end of this school of at this end of ministers conference, you're going to resign and say, Now I know that I wasn't called. And it's not a shame. It's a glory if you can do that. Some of you, you may have been genuinely called, but along the way, go ahead and pray.